You know, in the 3D manufacturing, additive manufacturing space, production runs of parts, well, that's been sort of the holy grail. The idea is to move this technology from a prototyping one-off tech into something in which you can make significant production runs and bridge that gap between tooling up for mass production, units of tens of thousands or hundred thousands, and of course, the one or two-off space that we think of with prototyping. I'm with Colin Hilkeny. He's the CEO of 3Diligent. Now, Colin, um, that space we're talking about, you're a manufacturing engineer, you're a design engineer, I've got a part, I'm going to need 400 of these things as a pilot run to, to, to show my customers, but I don't want to spend a fortune to tool up to right. actually make that in-house. Right. How does he bridge that gap? Well, you see, additive is, is in the process of evolving into being able to tackle that level of run. Uh, initially, you might think in that kind of a size that uh, molding uh, would be the appropriate path. You might do a urethane casting approach, you might do a small scale injection molding approach, but right now, we're seeing that bridge um, start to be covered more and more by additive technologies. Uh, you might have noticed recently HP made an announcement about uh, its jet fusion process, which promises to take an additional step in the direction of production runs. It, right now it's just run a nylon 12 material. We're very pleased to be announcing that we're offering that technology now at 3Diligent. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's one area where you can actually legitimately consider additive as an avenue for production runs. Now, it's, um, if I'm a design engineer, I, I've got a manufacturing process in mind in which I'm, I'm perhaps want to make half a million, million of these things ultimately, mm -hmm. half a million, a million large production runs, but to get from here to there, at this one, I do not have that capability in-house. How do I approach 3Diligent and say, help me, I need 500 of these? Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, so we really strove to create a very user-friendly experience, very intuitive experience where you can create an RFQ, it's a very keyword-driven RFQ form on our secure platform where we then have proprietary algorithms that analyze what you've described, and then we've got a team that analyzes the RFQ as well in addition to what the algorithm kicks out to say, this is an optimal solution for this particular project. So even if you may not know the exact translation from, hey, ultimately we're going to be using this material, but is it available or what is a rough equivalent in the additive world, that's where our expertise really lies. And then we'll come back to you and bid specifically what we're recommending as the optimal solution um, based on our significant breadth of capability across our network. Now you're talking about an online system here, and anything that's online you worry about security, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So how secure is that connection there? I'm not putting potentially IP issues, it's I'm really, really proud of that design, I don't want my competitors to find it. Right, right. So we absolutely considered that from the very beginning with our system, and there are a number of elements of our confidentiality approach. Uh, I think the, the first leg of it is that uh, our confidentiality agreement, we can sign NDAs directly with our customers, mm -hmm. and then we have NDAs in place with all of our existing supply networks. So if you check the box saying this is a confidential RFQ, you know that uh, the agreement we have in place with you and the agreement we have in place with our suppliers, it's extremely robust. We basically designed that agreement to have a longer period of confidentiality and more aggressive terms than basically anything out there. And we can't sign an NDA with you unless the confidentiality agreement we have in place with our partners is at least as stringent. You may be familiar with that confidentiality protection. The second thing is that when you check that box, we'll engage with you to figure out how you want us to uh, utilize our supply base. We can not engage them at all and just give you a our upfront assessment of the project and estimate with respect to pricing. We can go one partner at a time uh, based on our kind of rank order of who the best fit is. That's the second component. The third component is the actual security of the platform itself. So our lead technical advisor, uh, he architected the stamps.com platform. They're printing legal tender. Uh, and in addition to that, we utilize 128 secure socket layer protection encryption across the site. Uh, that's why you need to create an account actually to get into our site. You can't just lob out uh, parts straight away because we care so much about data protection. Everything takes place inside that secure socket layer protection. And it, that's the same level that's used for Facebook secure site, Amazon secure site. So, um, a very high level of security. Mm -hmm. Now it's um, um, low volume, high mix manufacturing, uh, pilot runs, limited manufacturing, of course, is often characterized by a need to have it yesterday. <laughs> it's, it's When you're thinking about half a million, a million parts and configuring a line, you'll give yourself six months to, to get that thing up and running. Right. If I need 400 of these, of course, I want them tomorrow. Right. Uh, how do lead times work in and, and, and your form of contract manufacturing? People want it tomorrow? I mean, what, what, how much does it take? Well, actually, that's really what we're able to deliver in a very unique way because we're capable of leveraging supply across our network. 
network and you can somewhat reliably count on capacity being available somewhere in that network and we can actually stitch that capacity together from multiple sources if say you had 400 parts, a machine can only run so fast and any given supplier may only have so many machines that can run. So we can stitch together maybe dozens and dozens of machines across a number of our supply points and have it all tied up in a single RFQ, a single PO for you instead of you having to juggle all that. How about materials? I mean, uh, if you're doing kids' toys, maybe you want it in commodity polypropylene, but if I'm doing a functional part, I need a glass-filled nylon, slick exotic, what range of materials can you work in? Yeah, an incredible range of materials. What I would say along those lines, um, We've got uh, pure modeling technologies, so I can go ahead and show something here. This is just a, actual pieces of paper put together, very, very affordable. We've got gypsum printing as well, which is in full color. Graduate up from that into resin technologies, so those are thermoset uh, polymers, so they're typically approaching the behavior of actual plastics, but uh, not quite there and can lose some of their properties over time. So it's really good as a modeling technology, not necessarily a production application. Then we have thermoplastics where we've got the full range from ABS to polycarbonate to Ultem. Uh, I'll go ahead and you've got that in your hand. This is the same material that's flying around on a bunch of Boeing and Airbus jets, uh, Ultem 9085. Um, because of a number of its heat deflection and, and, and smoke properties. Uh, and then we get into the metals. Obviously the metals is a big, big part of our business. So we've got a couple uh, parts right in front of us. This is a, an Inconel 625 part. We've got titanium 64. This is electron beam melted. So this is uh, a little bit uh, more cost effective for larger scale parts relative to uh, some of the laser melting for smaller ones. And then we've got Another half dozen or so technologies, actually more than that, that I didn't even mention right now that uh, span that gamut uh, from prototyping applications to actual production uses. Uh, drawings, uh, STL files, what formats uh, could they input drawings to? Yes, so we accept STL step and IGIS as far as our CAD design formats. You are capable of uploading PDF drawings whenever you submit an RFQ. Those are especially appreciated when we're going into machining applications, for instance, where it's not as uh, natively tied to, to CAD design. And the build envelope, of course, with additive manufacturing, we think about how big a part can we make? How, how big can you go? Oh, we can go real big. As a matter of fact, if you'll give me one second, I'll sneak over and grab this. So we've got some very large, uh, big area additive manufacturing capability. So you see these nice thick layers, that's because it came on a machine that has a build envelope 20 feet by 12 feet by six feet, I want to say. So real big. And then if we get into the metals, we can get a bit over a cubic yard in size large and small parts additively manufactured from a wide variety of materials from 3Diligent, says Colin Hill-Kenny.